Wellness for me is really being well at multiple levels of your being. We have an emotional body, a physical body, a mental body, an energetic body, and then a community body, right? That's our social body. That's Dr. Taz Bhatia, integrative medicine physician and wellness expert and one of the leading holistic doctors in the nation. Wellness is when all of those bodies are functioning in tandem at their optimal, right? You've got a community to go home to or to be in, and that's a big part of health. Regulation of your emotions is a critical component of wellness. Honestly, those things are driving the decision-making when it comes to your physical health. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Dr. Taz to discuss why true wellness goes beyond just physical health, the most common health challenges high achievers face and how to combat them, and how our communities and environments can either support or undermine our well-being. When a family is unhealthy or when there is a lack of family, you can give people stuff to do from here to eternity, but because they don't feel good and ha don't have a sense of belonging, they're not able to do those things. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not gonna push any made to order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. All right, Dr. Taz, welcome to the podcast. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. So I'm thrilled to, to, to have you here and I will say like just full disclosure up front for anybody listening, we've known each other for a number of years. I'm excited to bring you on because I think you offer a very, very unique approach to medicine, longevity, et cetera. And I think anybody listening could, can learn a lot. But before we get to all that, I'm just curious from a origin story standpoint, I'm always curious like what led to people becoming who they are today, like the career decisions they made, what shaped them. I mean, I could ask you simply, why did you decide to become a doctor? But Ultimately, I'm more interested in what led to you practicing the type of medicine you practice today. Yeah, I get asked that question uh, quite a bit. And I think I shock people when saying it was completely accidental. I mean, I look at young entrepreneurs today and like they have a five-year plan and a 10-year plan and all this stuff laid out. And for me, it was a lot of bumping around and a complete accident. I was an ER doctor. I came out having studied pediatrics and emergency medicine. I got my first job in an urgent care coming out of residency. And the intention was to go back. I had applied for pediatric intensive care fellowships. I love that type of medicine. And I had just come for one year and was gonna leave. My family was going through a lot of stuff here in Atlanta. So I was like, let me come, let me deal with that. And then I'm gonna go leave and go do my fellowship. And I took this urgent care job, didn't think much about it, but literally got like plucked out of there to then work in the ERs here in the Atlanta area and it was an opportunity, like sometimes these opportunities come and you can't say no, but they literally tripled my paycheck, you know, and at that time my family was having a lot of issues. My mom and dad were, without getting into too much detail, were having a lot of financial issues too. And I was sort of the one piecing everything back together. So I was like, okay, I can't turn this down. So long story short, I start this ER job. I love it. I'm a high adrenaline person. So I loved all of it. I loved the variety and I learned so much medicine more than I learned, you know, probably going through my training, but I was getting sick and I should probably say I was getting sicker. Probably the early signs were there even in med school and residency, but we ignore things as many of us do when we're busy and very type A. And then it got to where, because of the night shifts and the flip-flopping schedules and things like that, things really accelerated. I started to gain weight. I started to have joint pain, really severe acne. Hair loss was sort of the final straw for me, where literally people would look at me and you'd see my part and you would stare at my scalp. And, you know, it was so uncomfortable and so shaming in a way, right? Like you're seeing they're trying to 
give people advice or take care of people and they're looking at your scalp or looking at you head to toe. And so this went on for a couple of years. And of course, I met my husband. We started dating. And one day he just kind of looks at me and he's like, I think something's wrong. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, over the time I've known you, you've changed physically. He's like, not that I care. He couldn't have been sweeter about it in the way he worded it. But he's like, not that I care, but I think something's wrong. And I think you need to go get checked out. And it kind of shook me out of like whatever oblivion I was in, right? Because I've always been so work focused. And so my mom kind of chimed in at the same time. And it's like, yeah, something's not right. So that started the series of doctor's appointments. So I went to my GP or general practitioner and they were like, you're distressed, you know, you're anxious, take this medication. Went to somebody else and they kind of had the same diagnoses, then went to an endocrinologist and they were like, well, we don't check hormones. I don't think this is related to your hormones. Went to a rheumatologist because I was having this crazy joint pain kind of dismissed from there. So it just continued. And I think my final stop was an actual hair loss specialist, a world-renowned hair loss specialist. I remember him looking at me and he's like, I need you to take this medicine. If you don't take it, you're going to be bald by the time you're 30. At that point, I was like 27, maybe 27 years old. And so no young woman wants to hear that. So I, without thinking, and this is where my patients are often, without thinking, kind of blindly trusting, took the medication, didn't question, even though I'm a doctor, and I still don't really understand where my head was back then. I think when you're filled with shame and not feeling really great about yourself, you just sort of are in a bit of a fog. And I think I might have been in that fog when it came to me, great about everybody else, but foggy about me. And so I took the medication. And on this particular day, I take the medication, I go work out, jump back into the car and I'm driving and I start to get super dizzy and I end up having what is now, you know, now I know it was a syncopal episode. I've essentially passed out and swerved and hit the car and wrecked the car. But but kind of that shook me out of whatever I was in. It was like, oh my gosh, I could have hurt somebody else. I could have hurt myself. Like, what am I doing? Well, the medication, one of the side effects of the medication was that it drops your blood pressure. And I already, even to this day, walk around with pretty low blood pressure. And so it had bottomed it out when you combine a workout and probably being a little bit dehydrated, just bottomed my pressure out to where I passed out. So that was where I was like, I got to figure this out. I've got to stop this. Like someone's coming on a horse to save me. Someone else is going to figure this out. So it started this journey of me digging. And this is over 20 years ago, almost 25 years ago. You know, we don't have Google the way we have it in its entirety right now. We didn't have social media the way it is right now, right? So I'm like trying to find answers. And I find, I don't know how I found it, but I found there was a board of holistic medicine and they sponsored courses and classes. So I went to that and it was like this whole world I'd never heard of before talking about nutrition as being healing and the role of stress and all this other stuff, new ideas to me, stuff we don't touch in medical school. And from there, like I got introduced to Chinese medicine and I got super curious and I'm like, I wanna learn more about this. So I actually flew to California, did a Chinese herbalism and acupuncture class, got certified in acupuncture. I'm still a licensed acupuncturist and was fascinated by the way they think, you know, but more importantly, they looked at me and they were horrified by what they perceived in me. They were like, oh my gosh, this is bad. Bad chi is all they kept saying. And if you can imagine it, like these, you know, very old Chinese mentors and teachers and their bald glasses and like they're looking at me and they're like, bad, bad chi. And I'm like, wait, wait, what does that mean? What are you trying to say? What is bad chi? And so, you know, what they were trying to tell me is that it was very depleted. I had crashed my hormones. I crashed my gut. I crashed my nutrients. And they felt like my job was to really replete and build that all up. So they gave me formulas to take. They did acupuncture on me. And I kind of started to feel better. It was slow, but I started to feel better. But again, now once you've opened this knowledge faucet, I wanted more. And so, you know, I learned about Ayurvedic medicine. I myself became a certified nutrition specialist. And then through all of this, I found the fellowship in integrated medicine in Arizona with Dr. Annie Weil. So I was staring at it and I wanted to do it. But meanwhile, I'm working this ER job. I'm married by now. My husband's off in dental school. So I'm trying to figure out how to make all these pieces fit together. And at some point, I was like, I'm just going to do this. I'm doing this fellowship. So I did the fellowship in integrative medicine. It was a two-year program. And it really taught you how to put all the pieces together. And so in doing so, I healed myself. The journey had started as I was learning. And I learned things like I need to be gluten-free that my thyroid had crashed out. That was the cause of a lot of the hair loss and a lot of the weight gain and some of the other things that I was experiencing. I had a rampant inflammation. I had to deal with that. And that nice just probably were not the best thing for me long-term. So I had to think through that as well. 
And as I put my pieces together, everybody around me is like, what did you do? And what should I do about this? And what should I do about that? So I finished the fellowship. I think it was 2008 is when I finished the fellowship. My husband came out of dental school around the same time, and he's looking and watching this entire journey and watching people come up to us and watching all of this. And he's like, I think you need to do something with this. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I think it's too much energy and too much effort. And you know too much. I mean, he's like, just do something. He's like, it doesn't have to be big. or It doesn't have to be fancy. Just do something. And he was actually setting up his dental offices. He's like, why don't you take the back of my dental office? He goes, you don't have to worry about overhead. This is not a business. You know, he goes, all you have to do is show up, see a few people, help people. He genuinely was like, just help people. Don't worry about the rest. And I was like, I can do that. And so our master plan as a couple was that I would do this sort of console type work one or two days a week. I'd drop my ER shifts down. I used to do 14 to 16 ER shifts. I would drop them down to about eight. And in anticipation of our children, I'd be home every day by two or three o'clock. And that way I'd have a work life and I'd have a home life and everything would be perfectly balanced. Well, that's not exactly what happened. First of all, we had our first child. By the time she was six months old, I was already pregnant again with our second. We had closed on a space for his dental practice. And I just remember being like, how, how am I going to manage this? And again, he stepped in and he was like, we got it. Don't worry about it. So we start. So I dropped down uh, my ER shifts. I dropped down to, I think, eight to 10 ER shifts. I opened up this holistic practice. The original name was the Atlanta Center for Holistic and Integrative Medicine. And it was literally like I do acupuncture. I would do a couple of consults two days a week. No big deal. Well, it was no big deal for about six months. And then the word kind of got out that there's this doctor who does stuff, who's different. And the next thing I know, I was getting slammed to the point where I was taking over his dental chairs. We had people sitting on the floor waiting for me to see them next. People were started to drive in over the span of about a year, going into a year and a half, started to drive in from all over the Southeast. And it was just, it was just escalating into something that I didn't expect. And so there was a tipping point at which, you know, I'm working with patients and I have so many of those stories, but, you know, I'd give them information, I'd give them advice, they'd go to their regular doctor, they'd go to whoever. The doctors would be like, she's a quack, that's BS. There's absolutely no way that's possible. And the poor patient would be like, I don't know who to believe. Like, who who do I go with, you know? And I'm, I'm watching and I'm listening and I'm working my butt off. And I'm like, this is not going to work. This, this consult thing is, not, you know, literally I was like, this console crap is not going to work. People need a one-stop shop. They need a place where they can go and they get their answers and someone really is the quarterback for their care. So I'm having that download as I'm going through this journey. Meanwhile, I'm also taking over my husband's space. I'm leaving acupuncture needles near his dental chairs. We've got people on the floor. He's stepping over them to get to his stuff. And he walks in one day and he's like, done. He's like, we are done. You need your own space. I need my own space. We have now crossed over into complete chaos. First it was like calm and then it was like managed chaos. And now we've crossed over into complete chaos. So at that point, I really made a commitment, honestly. So it took me probably two years of being in the space accidentally. And like, this has got to be a full-time thing. I've got to grow this to where I have a team that we really take care of patients. There's a major gap out there and I need to figure out how, how to do this, but doing this halfway is not working. And so that's really what led to everything that currently exists the way you've seen it now. Yeah, and and obviously a, a lot to unpack there. I mean, just for people listening, they may not be familiar with the term like integrative medicine or functional medicine. They may not know what that is. How would you define that? People get so tripped over these terms. Really integrative medicine is the merging of different types of medicine together, right? Taking the best from older systems of medicine, from nutrition and lifestyle type modalities, herbs and supplements, to actually using medications and getting imaging and doing all the usual things we're trained to do in conventional medical school. The term functional medicine actually came after integrative medicine. It has a lot more notoriety, I feel like. But functional medicine gets more into the physiology. It gets very much into pathways and how things happen and what works and what doesn't work. It gets very granular. So the way I always explain it to people is holistic is taking the full view of your body and your health, everything from your mind and your emotions and your energy and even past stuff. And even if we get too woo-woo, even generational trauma and all that business, Integrative is the merging of different systems of medicine and functional is the physiology and the chemistry of your body and what's happening there and how we can manipulate it. 
And really what we're doing at Center Spring MD, honestly, is all of it, right? We're bringing it all together. I don't have a word for putting it all together, but that's exactly what we're doing because I think they're all very legitimate thoughts and fields of medicine, as is conventional medicine. I would never reject conventional medicine. We need it. But it's all about the art and the timing of who needs what in a given moment. That's the beauty of being a practitioner. And I think what practicing this way does, it it allows creativity when it comes to the medical provider. The way medicine is set up today, everyone's kind of robotic, right? Okay, you have this, therefore you do this. The protocol says that. Here's what you get. I'll see you in X amount of time. Rinse and repeat. Do it over and over again. So you've got a lot of burnt out doctors who are just trying to get to some goal point, right? I'm trying to get to retirement. I'm trying to get to this income level. I'm trying to accumulate this nest egg. Then I'm out. And the beauty of our practice is that the doctor really does get to be the doctor. The medical practitioner really does get to practice medicine and has this incredible toolbox in front of them and is always like, okay, what's going on with you? What does this person need? So they get to flex their creative ability from the knowledge that they've gathered and accumulated to make decisions. And so it makes us feel like we're actually practitioners rather than sort of like following, you know, this very scripted way of doing medicine. So I think that this is the future and I'm convinced it's the future. I know that in the business world, they always look at things and they're like, well, what's the bottom line? How do you grow this quickly? How do you chop it up and see something on the other end? And I've had a lot of those conversations and I keep landing in the conviction that this is the future of medicine. We've got to figure out how to do it right. This is not a rush to get to the right bottom line. This is a rush to get our systems and our processes in a place where doctors can be doctors, practitioners can be practitioners, and patients can have a place to go. And that, I think, is really what over time and over the years has led to the growth and the success of the practice. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's hard to argue that our healthcare system in America is not ideal. And, and in fact, it seems like a lot of conventional medicine is very transactional in nature, meaning that totally. you know, it's treating symptoms. Somebody comes in, they've got high blood pressure, yep. they prescribe some sort of drug for them. They say, come back and see me at X number of months. But this seemed to me like it, very much focusing on symptoms versus the medicine you practice is very much based on root causes. But I'd love it if you could speak to just what has contributed to the healthcare system being the way that it is. And, and I'm not trying to like poo-poo conventional medicine, but it seems like yeah. there's a lot of information that's not being taught in most medical schools. And there's a focus more on like sick care than, than health care. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how far back in history you want to go, but we have a couple of things that developed. And I think the hallmark time is probably the late 1800s, early 1900s is where we really saw the shift. And the shift was very deliberate, by the way. It wasn't an accidental shift. First of all, it's the age of industrialism. You've got railroads and the factories and all that other stuff happening. So there's this whole move from a previous time where medicine was very like kind of homegrown, right? Like very naturally oriented and that type of thing to this very sort of medication-based system of medicine. And so what happened was that as everything else got industrialized, medicine too got industrialized to the point that politically there was a separation between people who thought in this very scientific, very sort of industrialistic way, separating out and kind of blacklisting those who didn't. So that's where chiropractors kind of got a bad name. Naturopaths kind of got a bad name. Herbalists were kind of poo-pooed as witchcraft and all this other stuff. So we saw a very deliberate political separation somewhere in the early 1900s towards this very sort of industrialistic approach. Now, the approach had benefits, right? At that time, we had infectious disease. You had injuries. You had war. You had all these things that we needed this type of medicine for, for sure. So there were definitely successes and benefits. But as time went on, you know, I think what happened is you had big industrial tycoons putting their hand into medicine and really driving the direction that medicine would take for the next 100 years. And that's exactly what's played out. So we have a very pharmaceutical-based and pharmaceutical-based interest system of medicine to the point that we know that pharmaceutical companies are actually funding medical education. They are funding residency programs. There's a lot going on. Even the research that you see, it cracks me up sometimes on different things when doctors want to start pointing fingers at each other and talking about research, because even the research is often funded in particular ways for particular benefits. Like we know for any given drug, and Ozempic and Wegovy and all these drugs are the rage right now, but for any given drug, you know, a pharmaceutical company may do 50 studies, right? And even if 
49 of the studies say it's not doing anything. These are the negative side effects. But that one study gives them a glimmer of hope. That's the study that gets published and pushed forward. We've got a very biased system of medicine, and I'm not afraid to say that. I myself prescribe medications day in and day out for different things because that's what the patient needs. The problem I have is that when you label everything else that the patient needs as unnecessary or irrelevant or as quackery, that's not fair. It's simply not. And so I think that's the reason that the whole system of medicine has sort of gone from home-based, from family-based care, community care, where your doctor was almost like a member of your family, or at least was like a well-respected community member, right, that people turn to. In fact, in older traditions, the doctor was actually also the priest, right? It had that very important spiritual role as well in the community. So we've gone from there to this very industrialistic, very mechanistic approach that we can quantify, that we can measure, that we can monetize, and it's turned the system into a sick care system. So that's why you see it today, because if you're going to follow the money, the money is in the procedures, the pharmaceuticals, the hospitalizations, you know, the money is in sick care. Prevention from a commercial standpoint, from a capitalistic standpoint, is not really profitable. Profitable for a government that's trying to fund health insurance, right? It's profitable that way when you're trying to take care of your people because you bring overall health care costs down for a nation or for a group or for a community. But when you think individualistically, whether that's a company perspective or a private entity perspective, whatever it is, you know, it's all about what is profitable. And I think that has driven the system to a sick care system. And until we figure out how to really monetize a doctor's time and how to really monetize the interaction and the relationship of a doctor with a patient, I've been invited to all kinds of things, right? I've been asked to be on all kinds of different boards and I'll sit on these boards and I'll listen. And it's all about efficiency and scale and making things faster and making them quicker and Blah, blah, blah. And I keep, I've been doing this for a decade, I've been pushing back and being like, until you guys understand that you have to monetize the relationship of a medical provider, doctor, nurse, practitioner, whoever it may be, with their patient and allow for that time, because it's in that time together, whatever we want to call it, whether we want to call it holistic, integrative, functional, whatever you want to call it, you can put any label on it. But if that relationship is not there, you will continue to drive up healthcare costs. Because I can't tell you the number of times, like my hand, and every doctor can tell you this, our hands are on the door to walk out of the room. If I had a five-minute visit or a 10-minute visit, I'd keep going, right? But because we have these longer visits in the practice, I can stop and be like, okay, tell me more about that. And then you realize all the different factors contributing to a particular person's issues, right? And you can give them a solution that in the long run is actually more cost-effective than what seems like is more expensive in the short run. So that's fundamentally the issue is we have a system that's built around this idea that you need a drug, you need a surgery, you need a procedure, you need a hospitalization. Otherwise your medical experience is really not of value. And I think that's the fundamental problem that that exists. And it's shifting some, I think the consumer is driving the change, but the systems are not driving the change by any means. Yeah, how do you define wellness? Wellness for me is really being well at multiple levels of your being, right? I've been talking a lot about the five bodies. We have an emotional body, a physical body, a mental body, an energetic body, and then a community body, right? That's our social body is what I've been calling that. Wellness is when all of those bodies are functioning in tandem at their optimal, right? You've got a community to go home to or to be in. We are not meant to exist in isolation. That's why I think our future generations are really at risk because it's all about hanging out on the phone by yourself. So you need a community body. You need that body to be healthy. You need a healthy mind, right? We need a good, healthy mind, and that's a big part of health. Regulation of your emotions is a critical component of wellness and of health. And honestly, those things are driving the decision-making when it comes to your physical health. It's very difficult to tell someone, well, eat healthy. Like, why are you driving through McDonald's? They're like, don't eat that. Do this. You could wag your finger at people from here to eternity and tell them what to do. But if they're not in this cocoon of a good community, good support, good mental health, good emotional health, they can't make decisions. We know that the majority of decision making is emotional. It's not intellectual. So we can spout information at people all day long. 
But until we make them feel good and until we can help them or guide them on a path to feeling good, they're going to continue to do the same things. And we see that in practice all the time, no matter how smart they are, no matter how educated they are. So wellness is really the merging and the attention to all five layers of your body and really understanding that they work in tandem. They communicate and cooperate with each other. And it's not a single point. It's not your cholesterol is here and your CRP is here and you don't have oxidative stress and your inflammation markers are down. That's a part of it, but that's not the whole story. And I think, you know, as I do this longer and longer, it's hard to believe I'm 15 years in of doing this particular type of medicine, you know, that I myself have evolved from, okay, it's about numbers and data and labs to being like, okay, you're going to have the most benefit if I work over here and working over here, maybe I need you to build community. I need you to go make five friends, you know, and I need you to see those friends on a regular and consistent basis. Or if it's a husband, wife, how much time are you guys spending together? Are you really fostering and nurturing this bond that you built initially? Because that community of a family is critical for health, you know? And so I see, I think my greatest fear for the future as I watch people like my daughter and others around her, is that they don't value, she does, because she's seen a pretty tight family, but her peer group often talks about, well, family's not important. You know, I'd rather be by myself. Why would I hook up to somebody and have to sacrifice? And I think when you ask me about wellness, what I have observed and what I've experienced, honestly, personally, is that when a family is unhealthy or when there is a lack of family, you can give people stuff to do from here to eternity, but because they don't feel good and don't have a sense of belonging, they're not able to do those things. So I think wellness is really, we got to change that whole like sort of trendy wellness social media word that we use with wellness to really understanding how deep it is and how it's very mired in all these five bodies working together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for people that are familiar with like blue zones, it seems like those are places where totally. all of this yes. is dialed in. They've got family, they're eating like plant-based diets. There's a lot of physical activity, social engagement. You add all these things up and these people are you know are living longer, but it's not even just um, the, the lifespan uh, because I think as a society as a whole, we're all living longer, but it's the, the health span, it's kind of the life in those years. Very much. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, I know there's a lot of this podcast in particular, a lot of just entrepreneurs, high achieving individuals. What are some of the most common health challenges that you've observed amongst high achieving individuals? Many of us, myself included, right? One of our biggest challenges, I think, is managing the stress, right? The cortisol. And that stress and cortisol sort of overdrive presents itself in a number of different ways. And so that's where it goes from a general conversation to an individual conversation. But historically, what cortisol will do if it's not managed it will trigger changes in blood sugar. It'll trigger changes in the load of inflammation in your body. So that might present as I presented with joint pain, weird rashes, you know, some of these things that we talked about in the beginning, or it can present with weight gain, a lot of belly fat, changes in body composition, or it can present with cognitive changes. So all of a sudden you can't focus anymore, you can't concentrate, you're not sleeping at night. Like there are all these different sort of fallout symptoms is probably the best way to describe them when it comes to the stress that many type A individuals feel and put on themselves. So I think the number one thing that I notice is high cortisol. Now, it depends on where I catch them. If they're coming in early, kind of like you did, honestly, I feel like you were maybe earlier in the game. If someone's coming in early, then we can really set forth this path of, well, this is how you need to feed yourself, take care of yourself, sleep. These are the boundaries you need to put in, and those are gonna change these numbers. And inflammation, by the way, and high cortisol is not just about stress hormones. It's also about your metabolic markers. So when people talk about cholesterol and they talk about an A1C and they talk about all these sort of um, metabolic markers or markers of longevity and markers of health, they're often rooted in what cortisol is doing and what blood sugar is doing and what inflammation is doing. Really, I can boil everything probably down to those three kind of central ideas. And so if you're coming in early, then we can work at it and kind of get those numbers balanced, do a lot of education around it, help you use data, use trackers, use your personal information to really help you understand how to manage that in the context of your high stress life. Some though, like think about me being in a fog and being in oblivion, you know, continue to ignore their soft signs. They ignore the symptoms and they keep kind of powering through. That's the word that most type A people use. I'm just gonna power through this or I'm gonna close my eyes and it's gonna go away and these things are not gonna be an issue. So essentially what we wanna understand is that we've got to figure out, you know, if you're coming in 
in a deeper cortisol state, then sometimes you have a diagnosis. You may have blood sugar issues. You might have insulin regulation issues. You may have a lot of those different issues moving forward. And it may show up as a disease, like an autoimmune disease, or the worst is some of the stuff is actually leading to things like cancer and other diagnoses down the road. We all know uh, people, especially I know people listening to this podcast, like that are type A, high stress. And it seems like the body's very good at masking a lot of disease that many times people don't realize there's a problem until heart attack happens. And then they say, oh, I got to get my health under control. What are some of the red flags that you suggest someone, uh, you know, just should consider that would lead to them wanting to seek some professional help? There are a number of different red flags that I, you know, or we, I like that. I like red flags better than quiet symptoms. So some of those red flags are changes in energy. I think that's a big one. If you're a high energy person, you're a high powered person and you're having a shift in energy, then that's one of the biggest red flags, you know, that I see. Don't ignore that. Don't just assume you're stressed. Really pay attention to that. Another big red flag, I think, that I've seen over and over again for women, maybe this is more obvious for women, is changes in their cycle. I think if they're having new onset hormonal symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, skipping cycles, those type of things, to me, that's a big red flag. Another one is weight. If you've always been able to maintain your weight and now all of a sudden you're seeing belly fat or you're gaining weight rapidly, that is a big red flag as well. And then just your mental health. I always know when I'm off track, when because I have a pretty good stress tolerance, right? I can handle most things coming at me. But I know my tipping point with all of a sudden I'm getting like palpitations because things are happening or I'm getting angrier than I normally do or more anxious and that's showing up as trouble sleeping or some of those type of things. Those are major red flags as well. And I think it's important for the men listening to your show. For men, a lot of this shows up as anger. For men, if they find themselves getting angrier, having more outbursts, that cortisol is getting out of control. And over time, it's going to show up in numbers. It's going to show up as weight. It's going to show up as high blood pressure. It's going to show up as a lot of these different symptoms. So that's where we really want to make sure we've got a handle on this stuff and we're acting earlier rather than letting this stuff continue. And then there's a relationship fallout to that too, right? People are super stressed. They're having all these different red flags. They can't connect and interact back to that community that we're trying to create for everyone. They can't interact in that community and they're pushing people away. So that's where you start to see again, the family start to fray and you start to see the separation happen and things really come to a head at some point. It seems like just as a society as a whole, things have never been better in terms of like access to technology, a lot of like conveniences. You've got Ubers on demand, you can get groceries on demand. Is it also a function of like technology and, and screen time because People are the most overweight they've ever been, the most depressed, they're, they're anxious, they're lonely. Like, and and what, what do you think is contributing to that? Whew, so many factors. I think food quality is a factor. I think that is a big factor. And I think the availability of packaged and processed foods is contributing to the decline in society as well. Side story, real quickly, not to take too much time on this, but it was interesting. There's a production of the Archies, the comic Archies being done currently on Netflix, right? And it's actually based in India and it's super interesting. My husband brought up the point. He thinks that some of these things were there to sell burgers, hot dogs, and French fries and kind of romanticize them as a part of American life. So I think as we moved away from real food and whole food to this sort of restaurant-based eating or fast food eating, there's definitely been a decline in health. That same industrial revolution that I talked about where make food faster, cheaper, you know, whatever you want to call it with using more preservatives and salt and those type of things, that has resulted definitely a decline. But at the end of the day, I think it's like the movement away from community and the movement away from from like doing things a little bit slower, right? So taking time to prepare your food and cook your food and being so stressed. So it kind of comes down to how stressful our communities currently are and how as a couple or as an individual, we no longer place value on preparing food, nurturing ourselves, you know, taking the time to do that. Like you think about Europe, you go to the market in Europe a couple times a week. You don't go once a week and stock up a refrigerator and then throw half that stuff out, right? You're going because this is accessible by foot. You're going to the market two or three times a week to prepare what you need for the evening or for the next day and then you'll go again. And so I think the value of eating and communal eating and food is a big part of the decline 
in health because a lot of health is connected to the food we eat and how we eat and then the experience of that eating, right? So the other part of it is, okay, you go order the healthiest food out there, but you're eating it in a rush, sitting in front of your computer. Well, you're taking away from the satisfaction and the communal feeling of that. So to me, that's a major factor in health decline overall. I think secondly, a major factor in health decline is just, again, the way we do medicine. We don't talk about you know, how to take care of yourself. There was an emphasis on prevention in the past because there was a relationship. So I think not having that medical experience is a big decline in health as well, is a big factor in the overall decline in health. And I think the third is, as people live longer and we talk about longevity, we have to be more proactive. We are in a new environment, right? And part of this decline too is just the environmental changes. And, you know, whether you believe in climate change or not, we are seeing changes in the toxic load, in the viruses that are out in the environment. We're definitely seeing those changes. So as doctors, we all have to step up to that. But I think, you know, in the context of the environment changing, food quality going down, and then all of us living longer, we're sort of set up for more disease. So if you want to switch that equation around, you've got to be proactive. You have to understand where your markers of health are. Where are your metabolic markers? Where are your inflammation markers? Where are things like oxidative stress? Are you storing chemicals or holding on to chemicals? We have to understand all of that if we really truly want to be well for the long term. So how bad is sugar for you? Oh, man. So sugar is probably the ultimate drug, right? So sugar and salt. We could probably write books and books and books about what just sugar and salt have done, right? So sugar drives up insulin, drives up cortisol, leads to belly fat, changes our metabolic health, leads to inflammation, crashes the hormones, changes the microbiome, changes our mental health, you know, impacts ADD and ADHD. I mean, we can go on forever. And I think when you talk about the decline in health, the amount of sugar uh, consumption over over the course. If you look at things over the span of 100 years, has definitely gone up. We've gone from real sugar in small quantities to high fructose corn syrup that has left everybody with this palate for sugar. If you've ever tried a cake in Europe and a cake in America, you can see the difference very quickly, right? So we have this palate that demands high sugar. And so now we have to kind of untrain that palate to understanding that a little tiny bit of sugar is okay. And it needs to be real sugar. We don't need 20 other different kinds of sugar, just to have sugar, but just in really, really tiny quantities. On the note of, I know we were talking about foods and the, there's various diets out there. It seems like there's, you know, constantly new fad diets, whether it's like keto or carnivore, like, I mean, how, how do you recommend somebody navigates kind of, you know, the noise when it comes to all these different types of fad diets and, and various medical information? Like how, how can they determine what they should actually pay attention to, what is going to actually work for them? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because we work a lot with food and diets in the practice. And again, you got to realize I'm coming at this, having sat in the seat for about 15 years or so. And here's what I'm learning and finding. All the fad diets are exactly that. They're fads. So they are great as a short-term strategy. So you can cycle keto, you can cycle intermittent fast, you can you know, cycle some of these things because they do help kind of shock your system out of a traditional way of you eating and really introduce ways of bringing blood sugar down and bringing insulin down and those type of things. But day to day, day in and day out, what seems to be effective is honestly the anti-inflammatory, semi-vegetarian diet, not full vegetarian, semi-vegetarian diet, that really prioritizes getting the protein in, getting the fiber from fruits and vegetables, and then getting in those healthy fats. That time and time again seems to be effective. What's happening with some of these different diets is that they're swinging people to extremes and then we're having to medicate the extremes. So doing keto in a smart way for three weeks at a stretch can get blood sugar numbers down, can get insulin down, does seem to be really effective. But long-term keto then results in a rise in cholesterol, a rise in triglycerides, more liver toxicity, and a crash in your thyroid hormones and sometimes your adrenal hormones as well, right? So again, great for a short time, time to move on thereafter. Intermittent fasting works beautifully, seems to work better for men than it does for women for a lot of different hormonal reasons. But even for men, what we're doing is pushing the set point of your metabolism further down works great for 90 days, right? People start to lose weight. They understand that they're over consuming food. They don't need as much food as maybe they thought they did. Fantastic. But you hit that 90 day mark and metabolism drops. So then technically, if you're going to play the metabolism game, 
you should drop your intake again, or you're going to plateau when it comes to weight, or you're going to actually start to gain weight back. And so cycle fast, right? Shock the body a little bit. Intermittent fast five days a week, take two days off and eat normally. And so these are things that we're really seeing play out consistently. Paleo, let's talk about that one. That one was a fad for a while. So that is a great diet plan for folks that have gluten intolerance or have a lot of grain intolerance. They really have trouble with digestion, right? They're having more digestive issues. They need the protein, they need the vegetables. So it's a great way to get the right foods in. But does that mean you're never supposed to have any carbohydrate or any grain? No, that's not how the body works. So so we want to think about these diets as temporary and we want to think about them as being cyclical, where you do them for short stints to reset metabolism, to clean things out, but then you fall back to this baseline of an anti-inflammatory kind of semi-vegetarian diet. That does seem to be the right place for most people. Vegetarians have challenges, vegans have challenges, meat eaters have challenges. So these are the things we're always trying to evaluate and direct people in a in a certain way for a period of time, but then kind of ultimately have them land in this in this one particular place. Excellent. So I don't know if this applies to everyone, but as entrepreneurs are kind of starting their careers, they they have a lot of time, but they don't have a lot of money. So they're working hard, they're growing their business, they get their business to a point where they're financially successful, but now they're, you know, they're stressed out, either burned out or they're very unhealthy. And then they say, okay, now that I have money, but I don't have time, I'm gonna start buying back time. And then they get serious about their health. And then before you know it, they're jumping in saunas and, and cold plunges and yes. doing like therapy. <laughs> I love so, it. Yeah. I speak for myself here, but I'm just curious with all these different things, saunas, cold plunges, red light therapy, peptides, NAD, like, et cetera, like, does it help? Everything's helpful. The question is, you know, you can't make all these things a full-time job, right? The fundamentals, okay, let's talk day-to-day. And this is the exact conversation I have in the room. The day-to-day is the food you eat, the quality and quantity of your sleep, your relationships and your home, your ability to withstand and manage stress, and your hormone balance. To me, those are the day-to-day things. Now, saunas, cold plunges, red light therapy have all shown benefits, right? But does that mean you have to do all of them every single day? No, pick one or two that you can really stick with and enjoy. And and I think the key is that you enjoy and that you look forward to. And that in turn will augment kind of this basic stuff that you're doing. And if quarterly or once or twice a year, you really want to dial in deep into some of these alternative modalities, into some of these things, that's great, right? It's a jumpstart for the body, just like a detox is a jumpstart for the body. But we always want to land back on what's realistic, what's practical, what our day-to-day regimen looks like versus what a quarterly or twice a year or once a year type regimen looks like. So I love them all. I have a sauna, love sauna, go in there. It's a form of relaxation for me. You will never see me cold plunge. I hate the cold. I can't get in the cold, but I have people that love it and that's what they do and they see a lot of benefit from it. So go for it. I think red light therapy, a lot of promise. Another one that I love because I'm always loving the warmth and the heat. So that's one that I personally love and actually look forward to. Some people don't like it. That's not what they want to do, right? So all of these modalities have benefits for sure. It's just my advice always to patients is pick two that you love, add it to your daily plan and be consistent with it. And then that's your kind of wellness plan or self-care plan moving forward. To try to do everything that comes out and comes down the pipe, I think that becomes tough. Now, if you're just curious and always wanna try new things, why not? But if you're crushed for time and definitely money too, I think being laser focused on what you need, what your day-to-day looks like, and then what are the things that are kind of fun that you look forward to. And speaking of which, I guess looking ahead into the future, are there you know, certain advancements in medicine that, that excite you? I mean, it, it seems like there's a lot in terms of um, you know, certain scans and being able to diagnose disease early, being able to catch cancers early, like anything that sticks out to you? I think we're just going to get deeper and deeper, quite honestly, into the world of personalized medicine. I really think that's what's going to happen. I think we're going to have, you know, we, we're already seeing it, but I think it's going to expand how much information we have around particular genetic markers. Not to say that you're going to get a disease. That's not where I think medicine's going. I think that's where it's been. But more so to say some of what you've seen me do in practice, like you've got these five genes, they drive your chemistry. And because I know they're driving your chemistry, this is your plan, right? These are the things you need to augment, things you need to supplement, the things you need to eat. And that's going to help you stay for the long haul. I think that's a really, really exciting field of medicine. As funny as we see 
medicine and wellness continue to converge, you know, and we're seeing how more and more platforms and more and more technology, quite honestly, is developing to allow the patient or the consumer to really understand their health in a way they could never understand it before. Now, sometimes it's good and sometimes there's just too much information. But yes, now you can walk in and get a full body scan and understand what's going on. But you still, at the end of that scan, need a doctor to help guide you through the findings and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. You can do all kinds of tracking, but you still need that partner to assist you on how that tracking is relevant to your overall health plan, right? So I think we're going to continue to see advances in technology. I think we're going to continue to see advances in genomics and personalized medicine and have more information that way for sure. And we're probably going to see more integration and acceptance of older systems of medicine, herbal medicines, holistic medicines, homeopathy. I feel like all of those things are going to circle back around now and actually become relevant and have a seat at the table because we're learning that while pharmaceuticals are helpful, they have their limitations as well. Yeah. For someone who's listening, I, and I, this was me you know, many, many years ago where they're you know, frustrated by conventional medicine for whatever reason, and they hear you know, the things that we're talking about, and they're like, great, I would love to find someone like Dr. Taz, you know, but I, I just don't even know where to start or where to look. What advice do you give to them? Yeah, I mean, I think here's the good news today from where I started. There are a lot of people in the space. The space has grown incredibly. I couldn't be happier about that. I think there are a lot of good places training doctors. So you have the Institute of Functional Medicine. They put out a list of you know doctors around the world. My program, the program in integrative medicine with Dr. Andy Wiles, same thing. They put out a list of doctors who sort of think this way and want to practice this way. And then we at Center Spring, we continue to grow. We have a team. We have practitioners. You know, we are continuing to grow and open additional locations. So we're an option as well. But I do think having said that, like, I mean, there, there's so many options nowadays. I think now you even have conventional doctors questioning and wanting to practice this type of medicine. So I think more and more, it's less about I can't find somebody like this. It's more about like just trying to to do the legwork to identify who those people are in your community or who do you want to connect to, you know, even internationally or, or nationally. I'm sure you deal with this a lot, but just for, I'd say, older generations that may be more like skeptical, how would you encourage them to be a bit more open minded? Because I'll give an example with the younger generations. We're seeing this even in recent years, even the attitude towards alcohol. They're not drinkers, right? There's like the non-alcoholic movement, which is amazing. But for older generations, they're kind of, you know, it's not unreasonable for them to be stuck in their ways. So how do you address the skeptics? The proof is in the pudding, kind of, you know, so I think for them, they are always going to be skeptical. But I think when they see results and when they see, you know, what small changes can yield, I think that's when we turn them around as well. And unfortunately for that generation, sometimes they have to have a problem before they really see a result, you know, or before they really take action. So I think for a lot of the folks in the older generation, they're coming in because they're just not having a good experience with medicine the way it's built currently. And they're understanding that there's a different way to do things. Now, it's a little bit harder with them because they're very rooted into sort of that academic medicine. This person went here, that person went there. You know, I went to the best specialist type mentality. But, you know, I just think it's education. I think it's helping them understand the concepts, pointing it out in their health, and then really pushing them a bit. Like, do you really feel good? Do you have energy? Are you mentally alert? Are you emotionally stable? Have you built community? Where are your markers? You know, can you tell me back? I can tell you. Can you tell me back where your inflammation markers are, where your blood sugar is, where your cortisol and where your hormones are? If that generation does not have that information at their fingertips, then that should be the motivation for them to push forward and dive deeper into their health. And, and as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? I consider myself a game changer, believe it or not, but I think it's really about pushing the boundaries of whatever you're doing. I think it's asking tough questions. I think it's being curious. And I think it's being fearless to a certain extent, right? Like I meet doctors all the time. We're just scared. They're scared to come out of the box that they're in. They're scared to embrace new knowledge. They're scared to think differently. They're scared to go against the status quo. So game changers are fearless and they understand or they have a bigger vision and a bigger purpose than sort of the constraints and the rules put on them by society as it exists today, because we're actually seeing the future while we're living in today. And we're hoping that that future will become accessible to everyone, not just to a certain few. 
I want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Taz Bhatia for taking the time to speak with us today on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on our interview with Dr. Taz, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com. Oh, 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 oh